and it was the, the most traumatic thing I've ever been through in my life. But what was incredible was that throughout everything, thanks to the Sinclair method, I was able to retain my dignity. Welcome everybody, it's Katie with Embody Daily, and today I'm here with somebody who many of you might already know if you've seen the movie One Little Pill. I'm with Gary Bell. He is a fellow Sinclair Method warrior. Um, and Gary, I think you started on the Sinclair Method about six years ago, if that's correct, and we'll dive into that here as we get going. But I'm first of all just so excited to be chatting with you. I feel like this interview was something that was destined to happen. I remember when I first got on the Sinclair Method, I found your blog and I was just telling you, I was reading it and cracking up because you were so dang honest with your struggles with alcohol in such a funny way that I could relate. And I just felt kind of at ease with the way you were kind of articulating your experience through your written words. So Thank you for taking time to chat with me. I'm really excited to be here with you. Well, thank you. It's lovely to be chatting with you, Katie. Um, it's, uh, it's actually been six years gone April since I started the Sinclair Method. So it was the 2nd of April, 2013, when I took that first Naltrexone tablet. And it took a period of about 13 weeks for myself for extinction to take place. Um, I just thought, thought I would ask quite briefly, how, how long has it been for, for you? Yeah, um, it's been about two years since I started the Sinclair Method, a little over two years. And um, just coming up on one year of no alcohol which I don't remember the last day I drank because I wasn't planning for it to be the last, but I just kept having one month after another month of alcohol-free days and alcohol-free months that I just ultimately gave it up because it wasn't doing anything for me anymore. And I think I heard you say it's just a simpler life without alcohol, and I agree. Yeah, yeah. No having to carry naltrexone around with you everywhere. No more ki kill... Uh, I can't even pronounce it. Pill fob, he yeah. pill fob things, I think they're called. None of those things anymore. You can throw them out the window. Yeah, I still have mine on my keychain because you never know, but I doubt it I'll be opening it anytime soon. I, yeah, yeah, I think I have mine somewhere lurking around. It's it, it, it's probably right at the bottom of my desk drawer, covered in a load of mold and <laughs> still ink or something, you know. Yeah. Well, Gary, I want to ask you because I know you already said it took you 13 weeks to reach extinction, which is a very quick amount of time for most people. Like you were the ideal fast responder. So, um, I want to first have you kind of give a bit of a backstory about your struggles with alcohol before the Sinclair Method, because I know um, it was pretty serious. And you, I'm going to pull a quote from your blog where you wrote, the compulsion was on a very deep visceral level. In some ways, it was almost like an opportunistic hacker had found a backdoor exploit deep in the very source code of my brain and installed a piece of vicious malware, which then took my operating system hostage, which I just think that is spot on and hilarious because I felt the same way. So let's talk about your struggles with alcohol before you got on the Sinclair Method. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting that you've used that quote because one of the things which you'll find on many of the forums is that when people explain the the addiction and when they explain how t how TSM works, they do use um, quite quite often mechanical or IT style computer software style metaphors, and and that's quite interesting. So so you know that that whole sort of mechanical metaphor there um but you wanted to know what it was like uh before 
yeah, be, before TSM. It, in a nutshell, it was horrible. It, it was like I was one of nature's red shirts. You know the red shirts from out of Star Trek? Well, no, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> no, you, you don't get that reference. Well, in Star Trek, the TV show, a little in joke is that all of the crew members who wear these red, red tunics, they are the ones who quite often die horribly in away missions during every, every episode. And it's like, the, they are the disposable cast members, shall we say. They are the expendables. And that's what I felt like. I felt like one of nature's red shirts. I felt like one of nature's expendables. And it was like this whole feeling of having an expiry date, this tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Because on every level, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, um, when it came to relationships, I was just falling to bits. And I was just absolutely destroying myself and alienating many people who I loved in the process, alienating them quite horribly. So it, it was kind of like a slow suicide, but um, it, it, was, it, it, it was a very undignified slow suicide. And I mean, I, I still cringe when I recall some of the things which I did and said today you know when i think think back on on how i was pre tsm and i think one of the reasons why i set up my blog and why i did the podcast that i did and why i agreed to appear in one little pill it's it's partly it, it's it's been a mixture of two things partly it's been it's been an attempt at redemption on, on my part to pay back for my own sins for what such a, excuse my language, bastard I was whilst I was drinking. But it's, it's also, I think, I think a, a galvanising factor has also been my own anger at the treatment system that refused me this very powerful treat, treatment method. You know, I had doors slammed in my face when I tried to access this. I was showing medical professionals the book, The Cure for Alcoholism, and I was showing them the, uh, um, the, the annotated bibliography with all the clinical studies, and I was just getting the hand, you know, so that made me quite angry. So that combination of, of, of wanting to redeem myself and also feeling quite, quite angry at how I'd been treated and how I'd been kind of insulted really um, made me gravitate towards setting up a blog and saying to, to hell with it. So... So it galvanised me, and I also didn't have the best experience with my home group um, of Alcoholics Anonymous, to be quite truthful, so I had quite a few resentments there. So in a way, this was a little bit like giving the finger to, to them. Um, to, to be quite truthful, though, my attitude has actually changed a little bit towards AA. I, I was once one of the most anti-AA people you could imagine. I used to populate all these anti-AA forums, and I used to enjoy arguing with AAs. But now I just think, well okay, you know, if they get some, something out of it, then good for them. But as long as they don't try and step on my toes with what I've been trying to do. Absolutely. So 
I know you mentioned One Little Pill, and many people have seen you in One Little Pill, and I've actually had a number of people ask me, like, do you know what Gary's up to? Is he drinking? What's he up to now? So what have you been up to since you were filmed in One Little Pill, and are you still drinking? If not, how long have you been sober, and how are you doing? I have had two bottles of Newcastle Brown Ale over the course of over the six plus years. So that that's two bottles which I've had. Whoa, uh, wild! Calm down there. Yeah, wild. I know. Um, both times with naltrexone in my sip. Them. Most recently, I was offered a drink of some Coca Cola or someone, which I foolishly t- took a swig of without knowing that it actually had some alcohol in it. So that was a bit of a shocker. But other than all, all that, I've been completely abstinent. Wow. How has that? How has that been for you? Like to not be drinking? Do you miss alcohol? Do you think about it? What's it like to be? essentially sober and abstinent for six years it's it's interesting because one of the best quotes i read on this subject was by claudia christian our old friend claudia hi claudia in case you're watching this um which was where where she was talking about billboards for alcohol and how walking past or driving past all these you know, billboards for these alcoholic beverages. It, it was a bit like seeing a poster that 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 had ne written on it. Ne. Well, that's what it's like when I watch TV now. It's like ne ne. And when I walk into a shop, it's it's like a whole sea of ne. When I walk into a British news agent's on the back of one anyway um so it's strange it's like it it's like it's been deleted that that old reflex that old trigger it's been deleted some somehow there's no there's no reflex uh, uh, there's no sort of visceral reflex whenever i i see that type of imagery that stim, stimulates the addiction again and i mean even if i've had the most horrible sort of day or i'm going through quite a rough time or or whatever you know or having the worst type of trauma the weird thing is katie is that that same type of reflex that that used to just come out naturally whenever whenever i was having a difficult time or or whenever i wasn't having a difficult time for for that matter um it's just gone it's it's absent it, it it doesn't feel as if it's a question of willpower i feel as if something has actually been removed or something has been put to sleep if if that makes sense it's like it's it's like the beast you know the kraken shall not awaken again and i've just realized that, that i sound like a complete madman no well if you do because i totally relate to that and i've kind of thought of it like you know i've never thankfully been addicted to heroin or painkillers and so it's not like if I have a hard day, I'm going to immediately go to heroin to relieve myself. It's it's like the alcohol addiction has been erased. It feels that way where I can't remember what it's like to be drunk. I can't remember what it like it's like to feel that buzz and what that pleasure feel like feels like. It's like as if it never happened. And that is incredible. Lack of visceral recall. That's what that is. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So um, I know you've been fairly open with kind of your struggles that you've had with mental health and um, like you mentioned, some traumas in your life. So I know you've had a really, you know, some really hard things thrown your way through your sobriety journey. And I'm curious if you want to talk about that a little bit, because I think a lot of people struggle with alcohol use disorder and have 
a mental illness or mental disorder of some kind, whether it be depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, or all these different ways that we can struggle with our mental health. And so do you want to talk a little bit about what that was like for you um, with your own mental health um, issues, kind of when you were drinking and then, you know, how are you coping and taking care of yourself now that you're not drinking anymore, yet those issues are still with you? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to self-care, I'm doing the very best which I can. I'm taking my medication and I'm trying to stick to good habits. Um, however, at the moment, I'm not feeling, if, if, if I'm quite truthful and I don't want to turn this whole video into a downer, Katie, I mean, I'm not actually that well at the moment. I am suffering with depression and some anxiety. And for, uh, for quite a long time, I've had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, but recently that's been revised to schizoaffective disorder. So I also hear voices and suffer with paranoia. So th these are quite serious things. And um, recently I'd required hospitalization for it. But, but the amazing thing is, is just as I say, having the, those sort of extremely magnified emotions, um, you know, in the past before the Sinclair method, it was trigger city for me. I was literally having to walk on eggshells around my own emotions constantly. In AA, it's called stuffing your emotions. Whereas now, do you know what? I can rage. I can scream my head off. I can, if I like, you know, declare how pissed off I am with the world. And there's no danger of relapse. And that's absolutely incredible. So, so you know, I've got this psychotic illness and yet yet I, i'm not relapsing there's no lack of control there gary is in control um i think perhaps the most challenging thing on a personal level that i've had to deal with over the last few years certainly though has has been the loss of my mum um that's exacerbated the mental health condition somewhat um my mum was someone who i loved very dearly and she was the victim of a home invasion homicide arson robbery and it went to trial and it was the, the most traumatic thing I've ever been through in, in my life, to be quite truthful with you. Um, but what was incredible was that throughout everything, thanks to the Sinclair method, I was able to retain my dignity. Uh, that's what the Sinclair method gave me under that, that, those circumstances. It allowed me dignity and it allowed me the ability to actually support my family rather than to be a burden to them. Because out of all the triggers you could think of, something like that is, is probably one of the strongest triggers you can you can imagine isn't it absolutely and i remember you made a video i think called trigger proof and so like even though these things that used to be triggers for you i mean they're no longer triggers anymore because like you were saying it's like the alcohol addiction has been deleted that visceral response is not there so in my experience with that it's like you have no choice but to face it and alcohol can make you so weak. And like you said, you just become a burden because you're controlled by the alcohol. And when you can overcome that, especially with the Sinclair method, like you're strong enough to deal with these and you see what you're, you're made of when you have to face really hard things. Um, I know the death of your mom, I've, 
I know a little bit about it just from what I've read online and you've told me and that's like, that's just insane. That's awful. It is, it is, but I, you know what, as I think I wrote on, on my blog, I could have very easily become quite a bit a cruel man after what happened, but out of service to the good lady and to the good man who raised me, I, I've decided to be a good person and not to let the evil that killed her infect me. So, so it's it's it sort of redoubled. It sort of made me redouble my efforts to be a better person. So, Katie, there was something which I wanted to ask you, and this this is just you know talking about all things to do with like morality and being a good person or being a naughty person and all this <laughs> stuff. Um, if it, if you're on the internet with a blog or with um, a YouTube channel for any length of time, you always get trolls. I mean, it's it's an inevitability. And I've got to ask, what's your experience been like? With that? Yeah, um, I've definitely gotten trolls, meaning people who comment on my videos who are just they think I work for pharmaceutical companies and that I'm making all kinds of money by pushing naltrexone, which is, you know, naltrexone is a generic drug. Nobody's paying me to push it. Um, so I get that. I get people who are, you know, having had success with sobriety through AA, which good for them. Um, but they kind of think, you know, they're holding on to the beliefs that once an alcoholic, oh, is an alcoholic and this method doesn't deal with the root issue. Um, I've had people call me a cheater that I cheated my way to sobriety, um, and lots of other things. Some people I've had to block because they've just been like, you know, verbally abusive across all my videos and, and in my Instagram or other things. And so, um, at first it really hurt my feelings because I just, you know, really wanted to get the word out about this because it changed my life so much. And that was my whole intention with my first video. Like, you know, if I can help anybody just with this knowledge, I hope it does. Um, but Claudia actually helped me with that too, because she just kept telling me like, don't engage, don't engage. Um, just, you know, they're going to be there. Just don't engage. And um, for the most part, I've not engaged, but more recently I did respond to somebody through a quick video on my Instagram because they were really kind of attacking me. It was the person that was calling me a cheater and saying this wasn't a real solution and I just I got angry and like that's the beauty of sobriety like you're saying like you can feel all your emotions and like you know not to act out on them to hurt anyone but just to like speak my truth because that anger was driving me to do that um but yeah they're there and I I don't want to change beliefs of people I want to you know help people who are open to this and if you're not then like I don't need to influence you or change your mind. Um, I don't bash AA. I think it, like you were saying, if it works for you, like that's great. I think if we have a million different treatment options, that's great because everybody is unique to their, to their. Well, you know something. I'm, I'm actually going to say something here about this cheetah thing. I agree with it. It is a cheat and it's a, Freaking brilliant treat, cheat. It's the best cheat ever. It's the best walk around solution to, to such a horrible problem. And it, it, it's it, it, what's happened is that David Sinclair has discovered a hack, a biological hack, so that we can cheat the need for all these turgid sodden meetings and you know having to sit and uh you know give, give me a life story every what is it 90 meetings in 90 days and any of that kind of need it's just sidestepped it all all together and it, it's gone directly to the problem and it's hacked it that's what it's done it, you know, it's it, it's a brilliant biological hack 
So yes, it is a cheat, and it's a freaking brilliant one. I and, love it, Gary. And and you know what else? I'm going to say this very loudly here, but but there is no when it comes to a horrible addiction like alcohol addiction. Um, I don't see any moral problem whatsoever with cheating. You know, I mean, this this whole garbage about some some of us wanted to find an easier, softer way out. Well, yeah, damn right we do. Yeah. Damn, damn right we do, because, because I don't want to sit next to Mad Peter uh, four days a week listening to, to his insane rantings. I'm sorry, but I don't. If that's sobriety, I do, that's not the type of sobriety I wanted for myself. And ju just all the white knuckling and, again, having to, to walk on eggshells constantly around triggers and, you, you know, the whole thing about, how, you know, the spiritual ax axiom of anger, this ridiculous spiritual axiom where none of us are supposed to feel anger well guess what i have loads of anger i i have loads of it and i'm still here guys i'm still alive so <laughs> <laughs> yes that was a phenomenal rant thank you for that because i hadn't thought of it in that way like yeah it's a biohack and everyone's all into the hacking the life right now so you're so right <laughs> So, so yes, it is a cheat, and it's the most marvellous cheat ever because it just takes all of the... You see, to me, the definition of a cheat is something that takes the hard work out of something, and that's what, what this does because without the Sinclair method, it is hard work to cope with an alcohol addiction. It, it really is. It was for me anyway. And even with the Sinclair method, like I think people who do come from this approach of attacking and saying it's a cheat is that it's not just about taking a pill. And you know this. It's not just about, oh, everything's magical after you take the pill. I mean, you got to get to know yourself. You got to face the demons. You got to do some inner work, build your strength, you know, realize why you were drinking the way you were for so long. And it's the pill for me gave me that spaciousness and detached me from alcohol so that I could get to know myself and heal. And I'm still on that healing journey and will be forever. I think it's just a lifelong thing. But um, I, when I tried to get sober before, I was just battling the cravings. And it was this like tension inside me all the time. And perhaps if I would have been sober for years and years, they would have gone away. I never made it that long. But um, yeah, it's the greatest hack in the world for you to get over this once and for all and move on to live your life. It's like the ultimate computer game hack or something, isn't it? You know, it's brilliant. Yes. You mentioned earlier in the video that you reached extinction in 13 weeks. And considering your very troubled relationship to alcohol, I mean, I think sometimes people ask me, oh, I've been drinking really hard for 10 years. It's going to take me a while but it's not necessarily the case. And so why do you think you achieved extinction so quickly? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know because I had been a hard drinker for 16 years. So you would have assumed that it would have taken me quite a while to get well with the Sinclair method, but to have just taken 13 weeks is quite something. I mean, part of me, part of me had, w had wondered whether it might be a touch of the placebo effect going on, but when I think about it, and um, when I think back to Roy Scapper's book, The Cure for Alcoholism, and the work that David Sinclair did with, with his animal studies, with these trials, and the, the, he did something like hundreds of trials. Uh, the Sinclair method was specially bred um, alcohol-addicted rats, and he found that he could cure each one of them using naloxone, which is the sister drug of naltrexone, obviously, 
Well, here's the thing. I mean, when it comes to the placebo effect, it works on you. You know, the placebo is a very real thing with humans, but it doesn't really explain Sinclair's rats, does it? You know, for the success rates there. So, so, so there's got to be something in it. I think you know, with there's not just that. There's there's a lot of the other studies with, which 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 I've looked at, which which are pretty phenomenal. But what's interesting is that, that whenever anyone writes an article about the Sinclair method bashing it, they always seem to use uh, as an example some botch study where the incorrect protocol was used, where it was actually naltrexone but with abstinence, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, I just wonder whether it's because it, to go back to your original question about why it was so fast with myself. I just wonder whether it's because I have an especially sensitive endorphin system because I am quite a physical person. Hmm. I'm always curious um, what causes some people to respond really quickly and others not. And I think a lot of it is people getting stuck in habit or relying on alcohol too much to cope still. Um, And I notice more and more people kind of being aware of the fact, like in the forums, the Facebook groups, like, you know, they're frustrated because they know they're still drinking out of habit, but they can't seem to quite get over the hump. Um, So I was just curious, yeah, why do you think you responded so quickly? And I think it's hard to say, really. Yeah. Claudia thinks that it's because I'm more of a physical, that, that I was more physically addicted than psychologically addicted. That, that's what she thinks. She thinks that it's the, the, that it's the biological element, the physical element, that I was very strongly addicted with. Mm. And, uh, and less so with the psych- with the actual psychological elements. So that was Claudia's theory on it. I just had another question pop in my head that is off topic a little bit. But you said recently that you accidentally gulped some alcohol uh, that was in some Coke. And that's yeah. like a nightmare I have that that's going to happen to me. So what's, did you notice anything? Because you did it without naltrexone. Like, was there any long-term impact or what was that like? The, there wasn't any long-term impact whatsoever. I just immediately just, just went, Ugh! and gave the drink back to the person who had given it to me. Um, it, it, there wasn't anything malicious about it. He, he, he hadn't tried to spike me or anything like that. It was just that uh, that it, it was just an act of friendship. He just said, "Hey, Gary, do you fancy a swig?" And I, myself, assuming that it was just cork, I just said, "Well, all right." But I was just a victim of, uh, of my own naivety there. Because given the type of character he, he was, of course he put booze in it. <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> but he, he didn't realise that I'd actually been off it for years, so he was very apologetic. Yeah. But these things happen, I, I suppose, or can happen anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, the best thing to do is just not a freak out too much about it when when it does happen yeah yeah I've wondered like I literally have reoccurring dreams about accidentally drinking alcohol um but good to know it's not like you know anything too damaging I I do believe the with I mean Roy Scaff has talked about this before and and I and I think what he's quoted to me was that they found that that something like fortnight that it takes for people to become re-addicted to alcohol um, if they stop taking the pill, if if they drink alcohol without the pill. So I think just just with one sip, you're all right. What do you mean by fortnight? Um, 
a fortnight of, of solid drinking, of binge drinking. Or, I see. Got you. Or regular, regular drinking. That's what, what they seem to have found anywhere that, that within a fortnight, a lot of people are back to drinking as heavily as ever. So just to kind of, I guess, start to wrap up, I mean, Gary, you've been through a lot and you've been on the Sinclair Method. I mean, you started it over six years ago and you've been pretty much sober since then. Um, what advice do you have for others who might be struggling with alcohol addiction um, and perhaps even a mental illness along with it? What's your sage advice for people? Ooh, no uh, pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure, right. Just to follow the evidence that's the main thing just to follow the evidence um don't 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 follow emotion follow you use your brain use your, your critical faculties um basically just just try to sort of think your way out of things as best as you can try try a channel your inner Mr. Spock. That's my second Star Trek analogy for this video. Over my head. I'm sorry. I don't watch Star Trek. You don't even know who Mr. Spock is. I know who he is, but I've never seen the show. I'm sorry. I've been meaning to watch it for 10 years. I'm sure lots of people watching know what you're talking about. It's just me. <laughs> oh, well, that's completely deflated, that <laughs> reference then. But never mind. But, but yeah, just, just what I would urge people to do is just to, to channel the logical side of, of their brain and just to when when they're looking at the evidence around the Sinclair method or, or when they're looking I, I mean it's not just a one horse thing you know when it, when it comes to treatment you know if equally if they're interested in, in baclofen or uh, topiramate or something yeah I don't know how to topiramate or something yeah uh, yeah, I mean, there's a few di different drugs, but, but whatever t type of treatment, and there's Ibogaine, which has had, uh, you know, some, some uh, positive writing around it. You know, w when it comes to, to the research around these medical treatments, these evidence-based medical treatments, you know, don't don't just go with the first thing you read. That's that's my first bit of, of, of advice. Cross-check your references, you know, so don't just read Wikipedia and just take that for granted. So when you go on to Wikipedia and you read an article on uh, on the Sinclair method or on him again or, or, or whatever, click on the links at the bottom of the Wikipedia page and then when you take them to that, those pages, click on those links and then once you start getting interested in, in stuff that you read and then you get curious, start doing more Google searches and start cross-checking things to see whether they're correct. That that's my advice. You know, use try to use your critical faculties. Try try to. Well, I mean, we can all be quite guilty of bias, but but try to put bias in in, in the back seat and try and, uh, and look at things in, you know, an almost scientific light. And that's perfect. I think that's great advice. Gary, thank you so much for talking with me. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.